AP Physics 2, it is time for a new unit, specifically Unit 4 DC Circuits. And while the last unit, Electrostatics, was very, very theoretical and talked about all these charges and being held in place and the fields and the potentials that emerge from this, this is a much more practical, hands-on unit because ultimately we're going to be discussing the flow of electric current or really what we kind of think of as just electricity in general and how exactly we harness that. Now, this first lesson is going to be specifically on circuit basics and additionally Ohm's Law, which is pretty much unquestionably the most important relationship when studying these sorts of circuits. So let's first off just define what an electric circuit is. It's a combination of components that we put together that allow us to create an electrical current, more on that in a second, that will then be utilized to do work, to change energy from one form to another. And to have an electric circuit, we really need two things. The first thing we need is a source of potential difference, a.k.a. a source of voltage. Now, what I have right here are two uncharged plates, so like a capacitor that's not been charged up yet. And currently, there's no voltage here. But if I go ahead and charge it up, and I separate those charges so that one is positively and one is negatively charged, this would now be a voltage source. Another example, and one that we're actually going to see way more, would be a battery. So that is one piece. But the other thing we need to have a circuit is we need to have a closed conducting path from one side of this voltage source to the other side. So right here, what I have is I've got these two plates that were charged up. Now, what would happen immediately here is when we connected wires to it, now what would happen first off is we would automatically get an electric field forming along the surface of this wire, going from the positive plate through the lead that connects to the light bulb, through this, what we call the filament, to the other lead in the light bulb, it goes inside to out to this other lead, and then to the other plate. And this would almost immediately cause electrons to then flow from the negative plate to the positive plate. Keep it in mind that the electric field shows us the direction that the positive charges would go, but these are actually negative charges that are flowing. Now, a couple things about this. First off, it says a closed conductive path. If we have a break in the circuit of any sort, either like the wire is broken or we don't have a good connection, that is what is known as an open circuit because it's no longer a closed conducting path. Similarly, something else you might see is what is known as a short. And it may look like right here that we have a circuit. In some ways we do because the electrons would flow from here, but they would actually just go across the surface of this part of the light bulb and they would not be forced to go through the filament because charges typically take the path of least resistance. So they would go from this plate across the surface of this part of the light bulb and then to the positive plate, but in doing so they took a short path that bypassed this light bulb and therefore the light bulb is not going to light. And that is something known as a short circuit. So what exactly is an electric current? Well, first off, it can be abbreviated with the capital letter I, and an electric current can really just be thought of as a flow of electric charge. Now, I want to quickly note that technically speaking, what's really happening in most circuits is this energy is being pushed through through the electric field. However, this works just fine, and we're going to kind of consider this more simplistic version of analyzing current. So what's going to happen here is that electrons are going to flow from the negative into the battery to, for instance, the positive end of the battery, and in doing so, they're going to go through this light bulb and cause the light bulb to light. Now, a couple things here. First off, one thing we want to note is a capacitor has that imbalance of charge, and basically the charge is essentially equalized when the two ends of the capacitor are met. For a battery, it's a little bit different, and we're going to talk about this in more detail later on, but ultimately, this what's happening is this electrons are flowing continually, but these electrons over here are in a higher energy state than the electrons on the positive end of the battery. Now, one thing that's annoying, though, is that although we know that for a fact that electrons go from negative to positive, well, we knew a lot about circuits and electricity as a whole before we knew what an electron was. And so we went ahead and actually defined most things in terms of positive charges. So what we call conventional current, which is going to be the way we define the direction of the current, actually goes in the opposite direction of the way the electrons are actually flowing. So think about the direction of the current as being the direction that the electric field would go. It points from the positive to the negative. And how exactly do we go about calculating this current? Well, really, if we look at one point in the circuit, this current is the rate at which charge is flowing past this particular point, so past this like particular cross-sectional 
area. So really, it is a rate, so current I is equal to delta Q over delta T, where delta Q is the amount of charge passing that point in coulombs, and delta T is the amount of time we're looking at in seconds. So therefore, our current is going to have units of coulombs per second, which would give a fancier name and a symbol, a capital A, which stands for amperes. So an ampere is a coulomb per second. However, everyone just simply calls this amps. So, so many amps of current. So at this point, we're actually going to detour for a little bit and look at an analogy that we're going to utilize many, many times in this lesson, which is if you think about the word current, a lot of times what we think of is like a river, like flowing water. And that's actually where the term comes from, because really, when we didn't really know what electricity was, we basically treat it like a fluid because it behaves in a lot of ways similar to a fluid. It's just a fluid made of charge, for instance, rather than a fluid made of some liquid. And so, for instance, what we have here is I have actually down here on the bottom a very basic electric circuit. I know you don't recognize what all these pieces mean, but let's go ahead and note that this is a battery. I'll go ahead and note that real quick. It is a battery where this is the positive end and the negative end, so the current's gonna go from the positive to the negative, capital I. And what this is similar to is, let's say I've got, for instance, here on this upper hand situation, I've got like a trough of water and some pump that takes water from the bottom to the top and then runs down this slope and like turns this water wheel, for instance, at the bottom. And the current in this particular case, if we were thinking about it from a fluid perspective, would be capital Q, which was our volume flow rate. So the amount of volume of fluid flowing per unit time. Current is very analogous to this, except now it's the amount of charge flowing per unit time. Okay, so let's focus on this battery component for a second. So we have a long line and a short line, and this is the circuit symbol for a battery. You'll either see a long line and a short line, or you'll see some combination of these. This is really just a single cell battery. This is a multi-cell battery. But the important point we want to get here is that the positive is the long line, and the negative is the short line. So current should always go from the long line on the battery to the short line. And what exactly is this battery doing? Well, it's doing what this pump is doing, and basically driving this flow. Well, how exactly is that occurring? Well, battery has a voltage, a delta V, which we did a lot of detail with in the last unit, where it is a source of electric potential difference, that difference in electric potential energy per unit charge between two points. So we can calculate with this equation here, delta V, the voltage in volts or joules per coulomb, is equal to the difference in electric potential energy between two points in joules per unit charge that goes between those two points in coulombs. Now, we've got two sources of voltage that we might occasionally deal with. The first is a charge capacitor, and this is actually the circuit symbol for a capacitor. It's very simple, just basically two straight lines across from each other. And when we place this in a circuit, it generates a large, short-lived current because the charges equalize very, very quickly. And basically, unless we recharge the capacitor, the current is just going to immediately stop as soon as the capacitor is discharged. A battery behaves a little bit differently. So we place a battery in a circuit, it actually generates a much lower, but a much more long-lived current. It's a result of the chemical reactions in the battery, giving some electrons energy and basically recharging the electrons as they go back through the battery. And essentially, the battery is not going to stop until the chemical reaction inside of it essentially equalizes, and we no longer have that to essentially utilize. And that's why batteries can last literally years before we have to replace them. So looking at this analogy again, what exactly is a battery doing? Well, essentially it is changing the amount of energy that the flowing substance has. So if I look in the upper hand situation here, well, what is the pump doing? The pump is taking some external energy, like maybe fuel that's been poured into the pump or something along those lines, and it's taking the water that's at this low energy state and moving it up higher to a higher energy state that it can therefore then flow through the circuit. The battery behaves similarly. The battery is taking the chemical energy in the battery and raising the energy of the electrons from this low energy state to this high energy state, thus allowing the current to flow. All right, well, let's go ahead and look at another piece of this circuit here, which is this little zigzag. And what exactly is that? Well, that is something known as a resistor. And a resistor is going to be something that impedes this flow. If the battery is driving the current, well, then the resistor is going to slow it down. So resistance, which we abbreviate with a capital R, is essentially a measure of how difficult it is for charges to flow either through an entire circuit or through some component in a circuit. 
And at this point, we recognize a couple of relationships that are going to be real, real useful to combine. The first being that, well, if we've got more voltage, if I've got a battery with a greater potential difference, then that's going to create a larger current. It's going to allow more charges to flow more quickly. On the flip side of this, if I have more resistance, well, then that is going to be inversely related to the current. So if the resistance goes up, the current goes down. And let's go ahead and combine these into one single proportionality and say, okay, then the current is proportional to delta V and inversely proportional to R. And this right here is the foundation of a very important equation known as Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law we're going to utilize so many times, so you're pretty much just going to know it by heart by the end of this unit, which is I is equal to delta V over R. The current in a circuit, or in some part of a circuit, in amps, is equal to the voltage, or potential difference, across that component or circuit, in volts, divided by the resistance of the entire circuit, or that component of the circuit, in, okay, and here comes a new unit. We have this unit known as ohms. So this is looks like a horseshoe. This is a Greek letter omega, and it's basically equal to volts per amp. That's really how this works out here, but we call these ohms. So resistance are in terms of ohms. Now, technically speaking, not everything follows Ohm's law, really only what we know as ohmic resistors or bulbs or things like that do, but that's the vast majority of things we're going to deal with here in this unit. And another way I want to quickly point out is that this is a more conceptual way of thinking about Ohm's law, that if you increase the voltage, the current goes up. If you increase the resistance, the current goes down. This is much more cause and effect, that really it's the voltage in the batteries and the resistance from whatever we have that determines the current. However, you're going to often see this written as delta V equals IR. You'll even pass the here V equals IR as Ohm's law, just because sometimes we prefer multiplication to division. Good to recognize that relationship as well. So looking at our analogy, what exactly is resistance? Well, if resistance is impeding that flow, it's a lot like you can imagine having debris in like this chute or whatever that's essentially causing the water to slow down and essentially wasting, if you want to use that term, some of the water's energy. But let's go ahead and figure out how we calculate the resistance for a particular circuit component. So resistance, once again, is capital R, this measure of how difficult it is for charges to flow through a circuit. And it is measured in ohms. And an equation for it is rho. Keep in mind, this is a rho. Think of like the density that we used in fluids. So the Greek letter rho, kind of that weird P, times L over capital A. And let's talk about what all these pieces mean. Well, first off, we have the rho. And this is known as resistivity of a particular material in units of ohm meters. And essentially what this is telling me is if I have electric current flowing through some material, some materials are going to allow that flow to flow better than other materials. So if I have a high resistivity, a high number here, that means the material I'm looking at must be some sort of insulator that doesn't allow much current to flow. Whereas if I have a low resistivity, I mean really, really low, like fractions of one, then that's going to be a conductor because it allows current to flow very, very easily. The next piece is the length of this, for instance, piece of wire or component, which is measured in meters. And if I have a longer piece of wire, well, the electrons are going to have more things to bump into and be impeded by than a shorter piece of wire, so that's going to lead to a greater resistance. And then similarly, if I have a wider wire, if it has a greater cross-sectional area, that's actually going to result in less resistance than a skinnier wire. And that might seem a little surprising, but think back to when we talked about heat transfer and about having a wide for instance, piece of metal versus a thin piece of metal. Essentially, by having this wide piece of metal, you're allowing more charge to flow per unit time because there's essentially more pathways for that charge to flow. If you have a thinner piece of wire, it's going to be much, much more difficult. So resistance is equal to the resistivity in ohm meters times the length in meters over the cross-sectional area in meters squared, resulting in a number that will be in these ohms. Now, one thing I want to note is there are technically other factors that can determine the resistance of a circuit or a particular piece. Now, a very, very important environmental factor is actually temperature. Keep in mind that, okay, if I have a circuit that is heated up, is the current going to flow better or is it going to flow worse? Are the charges going to flow better or worse? And instinctively, we might think, okay, well, if it's hotter, wouldn't that allow the electrons to flow faster? And we would think, okay, higher temperature must have more current. It's actually not the case. And the reason is, is that the charges flow pretty quickly, no matter what. But if we have a high temperature, all of the other uh, molecules in the wire are essentially going to be vibrating 
much more, much more quickly, and that's going to cause the electrons to essentially be interfered with on a much, much greater basis. If we have a cooler wire, then those molecules aren't going to vibrate very much, and the electrons can much more easily navigate it. And this is why, for instance, when you hear about like computer servers or just computers in general, we have to keep them cooled down. If they get too hot, these circuits are going to start failing because current won't be able to flow the way that they are supposed to. Let's look at a quick example. Let's say a resistor that is one centimeter long and six times to the minus three meters cubed cross-sectional area is connected to a nine volt battery resulting in a current of 0 0.25 amps. We want to know what the resistivity of this resistor material is. All right, well, first off, let's go ahead and if we're looking for resistivity, we want probably the resistance equation, or R is equal to rho L over A, and we're going to solve for that resistivity. So resistivity, or rho, is equal to RA over L, and we can go ahead and plug in what we know, which is 0 0.006 meters squared for the area, and one semi long would be 0 0.01 meters, but we don't have that resistance. But we do have the voltage and the current, so we can utilize Ohm's law. And Ohm's law is I is equal to delta V over R. We rearrange it for the resistance and go ahead and plug in our values. So 9 volts divided by 0.25 amps gives me a resistance of 36 ohms. And that resistance I can then plug back into the original equation, and we get a resistivity of about 21.6 ohm meters. Now the last part of this analogy has to do with the light bulb. So let's take a second and look at the light bulb in the circuit. It is this incandescent light bulb, an old-fashioned type of the filament that heats up and gets really, really bright, that gets very hot to the touch. So this is a circuit symbol for a light bulb. You might also see an X. It means the exact same thing. And what we want to note is, okay, well, what exactly is happening here? Well, to understand that, let's actually take a step back and look at resistors. Because I know when I first learned about circuits, and when I learned about these resistors, you see a tiny one here being held by some pliers, I thought to myself, well, why do we want resistors? Don't we want currents to be as big as possible? And that's not actually always the case. One, the fact that a lot of things actually only operate with certain currents. you got to limit how big those currents are to make sure the pieces operate at the right capacity. But more importantly... Resistors essentially do work. They essentially cause electric current flowing through them to vibrate the molecules in the resistor, and they convert this electric potential energy into thermal energy, or if we build this resistor into a light bulb, even light energy. Essentially that it heats up so much it starts emitting light. Now let's go ahead and take a second and talk about a very key component then, which is power with capital P, and this is the rate at which work is done, or energy is converted, per unit time. So transitioning the electric potential energy to these other types of energy. So if I look at my power equation, which is good to know, which is P is equal to delta E over delta T, let's go ahead and see where this can lead us. Because if we substitute the type of energy with electric potential energy, I'm now going to take a little bit of a weird mathematical trick. I'm going to multiply this by 1, and by that I mean I multiply the top and the bottom by the same value, so they would cancel out and therefore be equal to 1. So I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by a little q, or a charge in coulombs. And now I'm going to rearrange this slightly, so I have q over delta t times delta ue over q. I basically just distributed the q's. And if I do this, I notice that this is current, and this is voltage, so specifically, electrical power, which we're going to measure in watts or joules per second, is the current in amps times the voltage in volts. Additionally, though, we have to keep one thing in mind, which is that if we have I is equal to delta V over R, well, if I substitute this in for I, I would have delta V times delta V or delta V squared over R. And if I rearrange this, so I basically multiply this across and put IR in for delta V, I would have I times IR or I squared R. So there are actually three different forms of this power equation. I delta V, delta V squared over R, and I squared R. But they all ultimately result in the same thing. So let's see how exactly that power manifests in this analogy one more time. That ultimately, if I look in the top situation, what we have is the water flowing down and the gravitational potential energy and even the kinetic energy of the water turns this water wheel, and that water wheel can therefore be used to do some sort of mechanical work. And that would be a form of power because we're changing the energy from one form to another. Same thing's going to happen here at the bottom. At the bottom, we've got electric charges going through the light bulb, causing the filament to warm up and eventually create light. And so we are changing electric potential energy to thermal and light energy. And actually, we're actually getting a similar effect here in the resistor. It's creating a lot of heat 
You would see that here as well. Maybe the sticks are moving around a little bit, but this is a much more applicable example. So what are the key takeaways for circuit basics in Ohm's Law, this first lesson in DC circuits? Well, one, can we conceptually explain and calculate current, voltage, and resistance? Can we utilize Ohm's Law, I is equal to delta V over R, for components of a circuit, as well as for the entire circuit it applies in both situations? And can we calculate the electrical power of certain components using P is equal I delta V, I squared R, or delta V squared over R?